So we just talked about high dimensional data and what high dimensional data is. And what I wanted to do now is show you a couple of really cool examples uh, from the primary literature of high dimensional data. And so we'll see the variety, a little bit of variety of the kinds of big data that we can collect as high dimensional and uh, also see a little bit of what's going on in the active research world in terms of people trying to understand high dimensional data. Um, so the first one I'm going to show you is a paper that uh, was published uh, with John Novembre as the first author back in 2008. And the title of the article is Genes Mirror Geography Within Europe. Okay? So in this, uh, in this research article, what they did uh, was uh, they collected genotypes of a large number of individuals of European ancestry. Um, and if you know um, anything about these uh, genotyping experiments, they measure the variation of, at a variety of sites within the chromosomes and, uh, and map the variation between individuals. And so the data set that they ended up with, uh, if we read the first couple of paragraphs of the article, they tell us how big the data set was. They used 31, 92 individuals. And for each of those people, they collected, I'm going to round, approximately 500,000 SNP loci. OK? So this is N. This is M, right? And their data, their data matrix looks like the following, uh, where this is uh, M and this is N, right? Not to scale, because obviously there's a, M is much larger than N. That's their data matrix. It's a very, very large data matrix. And so you can start by looking at individual people across all of their loci, or you can look at all of the loci across all, uh, one loci, locus across all of the people. That's all easy to do. But how do we actually understand the entire data set of this kind? Now, as a preview of what we're going to get to in the next couple of sections, what they ended up doing is an analysis called principal components analysis. Now, principal component analysis is something that once you hear about it once, you cannot stop hearing it. It is one of the most successful high dimensional analytic techniques in all of science engineering. It pops up all over the place. And so what these folks did was take this data matrix, this X data matrix that they've collected, which each number corresponds to the SNP of one particular SNP of one particular individual in their data set. So that's all these numbers in here. And Without going into the details of exactly what they did, they computed the principal components analysis of this data set, projected all of these data points instead of in 500,000 dimensions, projected in just two dimensions. Right? This is why you sometimes hear about PCA being referred to as a dimensionality reduction technique, which is really nice for both understanding data and visualizing data. And so here, what they've done is projected all the data sets onto PC1 and PC2. So this is a change of coordinates, right? So now instead of having 500,000 dimensional data, we're just looking at two dimensions. But we didn't pick two dimensions out of these. This is some transformation of data, and the details of which we'll go through later. But I just wanted to share the results to convince you that this is important and potentially interesting. So what they did was take each of these individuals and visualize each individual as a dot, as a location in the dimensions of the principal components, PC1 and PC2. And the various colors of these individuals, as well as the small letters, which you can look at if you uh, download the paper and look at the paper, corresponds to a particular individual and their nation of ethnic origin. And what they discovered is that by this relatively simple analysis, reducing this large data set into the two principal components, the relative location of these dots recapitulates the geography of Europe. Okay, so here's what they mean. So here's uh, the genetic map, and here's the geographic map of Europe. So what you can see here, down here, is in blue and in purple, we have Spain and Portugal. And Spain and Portugal right here in this group, they are closely related and not particularly close to this French group right here. That's the French group right there. Here are the British Isles. We have the Scandinavians. And we have uh, the Italians and the Greeks down there. Okay. So by this relatively simple analysis, the details of which we'll go into later, what they've done is reduced this 
very complicated data set into a form where we can look at it simply on a piece of paper in two dimensions and already start to find some things that are interesting. Right? So here, what we see is that the relative location of the dots in gene space is strikingly similar to the relative locations of the origin of these people in geography. And this sort of makes sense. Right? This is something that, that we are probably simultaneously surprised by and also not so surprised by. Right? It sort of makes sense. Um, and so that's one thing that we can do with very high data sets of one particular type. So here, what they've done is collect data over a lot of different people, over a lot, uh, over a lot of different measurements. Okay. So next, what I'm going to show you is a completely different type of data set that is also high dimensional. So I'm going to show you a different paper, and uh, and and this paper is uh, is interesting because instead of measuring a lot of individuals, they are only measuring one individual at a time. So uh, this paper by Misha Ahrens et al. is called Whole Brain Functional Imaging at Cellular Resolution Using Light Sheet Microscopy. So light sheet microscopy is this new technique where they can use a, um, a clever imaging trick along with a, a special model organism in order to see the cellular activity of every single neuron inside a complete vertebrate animal. So their model system is the is a larval zebrafish. And so the zebrafish is a fish. Um, and because it's in a larval state, it has a special property that it's practically transparent, which is really, really wonderful for, for imaging analyses. And so what they were able to do was use a special technique that they've invented called light sheet microscopy in order to image all approximately 100,000 neurons. So now instead of a lot of people, n equals approximately 100,000 neurons. And the measurements, we're going to get one measurement approximately every one second. And they can do the experiment for, let's say, an hour. right? So M now, instead of being a lot of measurements that are static at different locations, are a lot of measurements in time. right? So if the, uh, if the frequency of the capture is approximately once per second, and we have about an hour's worth of data, right? then M, the number of measurements that we have, is 60 seconds times 60 minutes, right? So that's the number of measurements we have. So this data matrix here is, uh, is going to be more like the following. I'm trying to draw it more to scale this time. So we have a bunch of neurons and a bunch of measurements in time for every single one of those neurons, where this is, uh, in this particular case, it's time. Okay? And so what they were able to do uh, and because in this case the data is intrinsically varies in time, they can visualize it as a movie. Um, and uh, here is a schematic of the kind of data they're collecting and the kind of resolution they're able to get to zoom into every single neuron. So a pretty big technical feat. And uh, what you can see is that there are patterns that emerge when you have this much data, right? You can look at each individual neuron one at a time, look at it through time. You can look at snap processing time over all of the neurons. But what we really like to do is be able to glean patterns of activity from all of these large data sets, this high dimensional large data set at the same time. Right? Because what we suspect is that not every single one of those neurons is doing something totally different. There are actually coordinated activity among them so that they can produce some behavior that is relevant. Right? And this is a similar thing that we can say about the SNPs data set as well. Right? It's not like every single one of those individuals that they took measurements from, that they, that they genotyped, is just totally different and very, very special. There are clearly patterns in it. Right? And the patterns in that case correspond to their the ge geography of their ethnic origin. And in the case of neurons, what we suspect is that there are actual circuits, these networks of neurons that work together to accomplish some task, especially sometimes. And that, that kind of coordination of activity, the organization of the nervous system, should be reflected in this X matrix. And so if we're able to reduce the dimensionality of this X matrix and analyze the data that way, perhaps we can learn something about the functional organization of the brain on a cell-by-cell -cell basis, because we have this new technology and this new data set. And so what I'm trying to convince you of is that here are two examples, two concrete examples, but there's actually many, many more out there. Uh, where there's technology and infrastructure now where we're able to acquire lots and lots of information 
about lots and lots of samples. And at some point during the publication process, depending on the, the funding source of these, uh, of these publications, these data sets become open and available to the public and to the research public. And so what I think is happening and in, in, in the field of biology, in the study of biology, that has already happened in a number of other scientific disciplines, is that the pace of discovery is now less limited, is becoming less limited by who can collect more data, who can acquire more data, and going into a phase where it's more limited by who can understand and analyze this data. Um, and so I hope what I've convinced you of is uh, that there's two cool examples, and there's many, many more, of really big high dimensional data that are being collected. Um, and so what we're going to be talking about next are some analytic techniques to be able to deal with data when they're of this type.